We'll get that back up. Um, I also want to give you an update about Esther. Those of you that are praying for us, we took off to Tennessee last week, and we're up there to actually see her graduate from boot camp. Uh, she's with the ROTC program trying to pay her way through nursing school, and she uh, is enlisted in the ROTC program, which will allow her to get a GI Bill. They gave her a check for $50,000 or something like that just to, for that, but she's got to commit her life to the Army. And so she went to boot camp this summer, 31 days, and just like a regular boot camp, and she graduated from that. We went up there to see her for that. And then from there, um, she'll go to school this fall. Next summer, she goes into officer training boot camp. And uh, she'll be a second lieutenant in the United States Army. And then she'll finish up her nursing. She'll go to a full commission as a second lieutenant. They will ship her off someplace around the world to be a nurse uh, in the Army. Uh, but it's an eight-year program. And so she will have to fulfill eight years to pay it all back. And so she will be done when she's about 30. Um, she will hopefully, she thinks she might be a major by then as the way things progresses. And so uh, the, the good sign of all that was that she ended up, um, was telling me that the Lord has been working on her heart. She said, just be in prayer, you know, that uh, like Tessa's saying, how can some people have all of this and not realize how great God is? And Esther's been there and she's turned her back on it. Now she's slowly coming back. So keep on praying for her on that. Uh, just so that you know, some people have asked me, Pastor, why did you go? I, you know, she's done this. We've church disciplined her and all that kind of stuff. And in my heart, the way the Lord had given me peace about that is, one, for two years, I cut her completely off. I didn't talk to her, didn't text her, nothing at all. Um, but I felt that in my heart that if, the, if she was going to come back, there needed to be some, at least some communication channel there. Um, I know her very well, and rather than push her away to such a point where she feels like she's cut off so far she could never come back, I want her to know at least that in the, not in morality and not in spirituality, we do, we do not have a connection. But she's still my daughter. And when it came to this endeavor of hers to finish nursing school by way of the ROTC program, the GI Bill, I could at least keep that channel open and say, listen, I'm proud of you for what you're trying to do in life. So we opened up that door, that channel, and she was willing to communicate through that. And so th through that, I felt like the Lord gave me, Debbie, peace about that so that we could have that channel open to communicate with her on that level. And through that, we've been able also to get spiritual things in as well. And so that's all been good. And so at this point, that's where it's at. Um, so just keep praying for her. Um, we had a good visit with her while she was up there. I believe the Lord is working on her heart. Will she ever come back? I have no idea. I have no idea. I know that when she finishes nursing school, they're going to ship her off anyway someplace around the world. So, But, you know, at this point, I'm just hoping that she'll come back to the Lord. Amen. That's the main thing, Amen. you know. Um, so just keep, keep praying for that. All right, ushers, come on forward. We'll take up our offering this afternoon. Um, one of the Lamberts was on schedule, brother. Are they not? They're not here today. They're sick. Okay, somebody want to play an offertory? We need, uh, uh, Debbie can come up and play something. All right, thank you. I was wondering where they were. We miss the Lamberts. They're always here. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Well, good deal. Let's go ahead. And uh, Debbie says, pray long so she can find something. But uh, we want to make sure also we give a love offering to Brother Rodney. I know a number of you have already done that this morning. And so if you fail to do that, forgot about that, go ahead and put something in for Rodney and his family. Uh, he is still on missionary support. Although he is the, the general director of GFF now, uh, he does not draw salary from them at all. So he does this as a missionary. And so basically the money that he gets from churches is how he lives his life. Now, we support him monthly as one of our missionaries, but uh, when he goes to other churches, he, that's some extra money that they definitely need uh, to make ends meet. So let's give him a good love offering. We, we, we've given some this morning, and if you'd like to give some more, 
You can, just make sure on the envelope, you put in the memo section for Love Offering Rodney, something like that. If it's just cash, uh, put it in the envelope so we know it's also for Rodney, so we know that as well. We wanna make sure that money gets to him, okay, before he leaves today. All right, and uh, by the way, do you see the button on Logan's uh, lapel? It's his birthday tomorrow. And uh, he will be, how, who, who can guess how old, he, how old he is? Go ahead, yeah. 37. No, not quite that old. Yeah, Rodney. 20. He's going to be 20 years old tomorrow. So happy birthday to Brother Logan. God bless you, buddy. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Titus, go ahead and pray, buddy. Okay, very good. Let's go ahead and get started. We are talking about the Family Focus series. We've talked about a lot of issues regarding the men, and uh, today we are going to continue on with what wives wish their husbands knew about women. And a number, let's see, one, two, three, four, five of you turned some things in. Uh, all very helpful things. I will get to those in just a few minutes. Before we get to that point, though, I want to give you, in a general sense, some thoughts about marriage in general. And uh, Rodney did not know I was going to be, I have been teaching on the series of family. And so perfect message this morning to follow up with that. So here's a couple thoughts for you to challenge you. God designed marriage. How many believe that? Say amen. This is God's idea. It wasn't man's idea. It, you look at the animal kingdom. Animals don't get married. Uh, this was all of God. God made us in His image. This is His idea. So here we go. Why did God create marriage? Well, some people say procreation. We could have been allowed for the man and woman like the animals. Well, you just, you know, marriage is just to have kids. Well, it's more than that. It seems that the base nature of man is progressively heading to this anyway. Just basically having sex outside of marriage is very completely normal, permissible here in America. It seems like it goes on and on. It's amazing how many people that you'll meet these days that are surprised when someone says that they are a virgin. Isn't that amazing? It's an amazing thing. And of course, I did not see this episode, but I'm one of the, I heard it on a, uh, an article I was reading about the bachelor or bachelorette. 
She was dating a guy, and basically he said uh, on The Bachelor how they weed out the different ones they're going to date and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he said that he was a virgin, and he was saving her marriage. And uh, she, the next episode, said, I don't want you, because that was not what she wanted to do. She just wanted to be the player, I guess. And uh, this is the way it is nowadays. If you are a virgin, you're saving yourself, you are unusual. I'm telling you, it's amazing in America how, how far away from morality we have gone. And so we, we understand God speaks very clearly, though, these verses. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But everybody say the next two words with me. Ready? Whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Who's a whoremonger? We don't use that word that much anymore, do we? Hardly ever. We call somebody a whoremonger or an adulterer. Well, you know what an adulterer is. What's a whoremonger? Someone who sleeps around. Someone that's just always whoring around. Uh, that is very prevalent in our culture. So God says, I honor the bed. The, the marriage bed is what is pure in my sight. When you're married, but whoremongers and adulterers, I will judge. And God has spoken. So he has set man apart from the animal kingdom. God has given man morality. a woman, they should see order, they should see dignity, honor, and respect. That's what God wants. But we don't see that that often is all, at all. Now, Psalm 19.1 says this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. You know that passage of scripture. Marriage also is part of God's design for the glory of God. So how does marriage then glorify the Lord? So here's a good question. How do the heavens glorify the Lord? The heavens declare, de declare the glory of God by simply doing what they were created and designed to do. That glorifies the Creator. We, when, when God the Creator makes something for a purpose, and then that purpose, that thing, it does what it's purpose to do, it glorifies the Creator. That's the way it works. So when we see all the glory, Here's a secular list. Some people say they get married because, well, I, I, I need to have security, someone I can stick with in tough times. Um, well, when I get married, I feel and act like I'm part of a team. That's part of it. Sense of rootedness and calm satisfaction. Some people just need to be married. I know some, I know some people right now that they cannot not be married. Um, if they're divorced, next thing you know, they have to be married again. Um, Larry King. Have you heard about Larry King? Larry King, you know who I'm talking about? This yeah. guy that's older than dirt. Yeah. Uh, he's like 90 years old. He just divorced his seventh wife. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I just heard it on the news. Seven wives? Who would do that? But he's a guy that has to be married to somebody. And then he'll divorce her and get married again. Some people need that. That's secular thought there. I just need somebody in my life. If I have to change every now and then, I'll do that, but I've got to have somebody in my life. It shows how important your partner is to you when you get married. You've been dating this person, and so we are living together. You know what? You're really important to me. Important to me. Let's go ahead and get married. That's one reason why people do it. 
Practical benefits, health care, Social Security, et cetera, as well. Married people, uh, again, so that they can have more of that. That's, these are lists I've come across uh, in the secular realm. They do this because this is what they want in their secular life. So why do people get married biblically? Well, number one, the plan of God for your life. This is why we get married. I married my wife because I knew it was what God wanted me to do. It was a plan of God. Genesis. My wife. So God's... I knew I was going to be a pastor. I knew I was going to go into all of that. And so I was thinking that not only did I, I knew the Lord wanted me to be married to this woman, but also I wanted to magnify God. I wanted my marriage to be an example to the world about God's glory. That was what it was all about. Also, Brother Rodney talked about that this morning, about passing on your faith to the next generation. The reason why I believe with all my heart that God would have us have children. And with those children, I would pass on what God had done in my life to those children in which they then would pass on to their children. So Psalm 127, Lo, children are inherited of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. And I believe God would give us kids. And we just allow the Lord in my life, my wife and I, we decided that we would not use birth control. I'm not against that. If that's what you feel like you and the Lord want to do. Uh, but we decided at that time, if God wants to give us children, then we're going to take the children. And we'll have as many as the Lord would let us have. And he would take care of the, us as we would do that. And he did. And so we ended up having uh, 10 pregnancies, 9 births. We lost a child. And uh, we do thank the Lord for all the children that God has given to us. And we believe that's the fruit of the womb was his reward. We simply wanted to honor the Lord. Another big biblical reason is to pass on his glory to another generation presenting to the world a godly home, fulfilling the purpose that God intended for you as a man and a woman. Uh, God wants me to be a father, like Brother Rodney preached this morning. He wants me to be a leader, my wife to be help me, and show the world what that means by raising children. So having and training children for the Lord. Ministering to others as a family. By the way, let me go back to that one. It was always my goal uh, that our family would minister together. 
And so when we would go door to door on visitation with the church, uh, we took our family. I had a kid on my back, a kid in a, in a stroller, probably two kids in a stroller, and one hanging on here, and I'd give them the tracks, and I'd knock on the door, and they'd hold the track out. What, what unsafe person wouldn't look at a little kid saying, here, Dad, and, oh, you want to take the track? I use that to my advantage all the time. We'd go to the mall or we'd go to Walmart. I'd give the kids tracks. They'd walk up, just give tracks out. <laughs> you know, kids have no, no uh, fear at all when it comes to that. And people take it right from a kid. Who's going to say, I don't want that from you? No, I'll take that. So we did that. We sang together. We, we traveled together. We did all kinds of stuff in the church. My kids were part of the church. Uh, we cleaned the church together. Uh, we sing specials together. We teach them how to sing, how to play, whatever. It was all part of, as a family, we have an identity of the Davis family. And that's what I wanted for, for, to glorify the Lord. So that was all part of it as we started doing that together. Now, as we go on, I want you to understand something. We must understand and discern what are worldly ideas and affirm biblical principles. One of the things that I always tell people when I teach this type of stuff is that the world is opposite of what the scriptures teach about the family and and nowadays it's even more so more opposite where if you will back in the 70s and 80s you still had even unsafe people having you know families that were uh, pretty much you know even still strong not anymore not anymore and when you take a biblical stand about your family, you're going to find that you're getting farther and farther away from what is the normal in our society, and that's the problem that we have. So here we go. Here's some, some scripture points for you. Psalm 1-1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sitters, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Okay? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law did he meditate day and night. A long time ago, I decided... I was simply going to do it God's way. If God said, as a father, I've got to do a certain thing, then I simply said, I'm going to do it that way. If it said, don't do this, then I didn't do that. My wife, the same thing. My wife was going to do certain things the Bible way, and, and the, anything else, she just wasn't going to do it. So we decided that with all of our heart. Yeah, when people all around us said, don't spank your kids, you shouldn't be spanking your kids. I read in the scriptures that, you know, if you withhold correction from a child, you hate the child. You cause problems for the child. And then I, I understood the scriptures very clearly that whenever you do spank in a loving, disciplining way, you curb the nature of that child. You help that child. The foolishness that's bound up in the heart of that child, you'll drive it far from him. And that's what we decided to do. And we started doing that at an early age. So that's why we spank the kids. Now, grandkids, I have a totally different philosophy. I just spoil them and let them go like crazy. I'm just kidding. Um, but it's hard to spank a grandkid, I'm telling you. And when we were gone, it wasn't long ago, about a week or so ago, when uh, we were watching the baby boys, uh, Gabe and Garrett, and Elisa was having a baby. Uh, we were watching Gabe and Garrett, and they were over at the house, and Gabe just, ah, he just went crazy. And uh, I, he's looking at me now, Paul, Paul, what are you talking about? But he, he just got all upset at Chloe, and he was screaming at Chloe, and he went and he slammed the door. And I was in my study, and I could hear all this. So I came out of the study, and I said, Gabe. And he started getting all upset, and I took him into my bedroom, and I spanked Gabe. It was hard to do. But you know what? I loved on him. We cried together, and I, you know, I said, that's going to be okay, you know. But you know what? Even as a grandfather, I realized, you know what? He needs this. His mom and daddy do it all the time. And I think he, I, th I think, I think they do do it. But I think when he came to my house, because they weren't there, that he could get away with it. But now when Papo did it, I think he realizes, oh, no, Papo does it too. And so that's, that's part of it. So anyway, we, you, you spank that child. Why? Because God says to. God says to. And you do it the right way, right? So obey the Lord. That's all I'm getting at. Just simply do what God says to do. So you're ready to be blessed in your marriage. Delight in the law. Reject any worldly ideas of marriage. My wife, um, you know, I realize that some of you ladies have to work. I get that. In our age and day, the day in which we live, it's finances and that, that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that you're in sin if you work and that kind of stuff. I get it. Some of you have to do that. But my wife and I, we really did early on 
decided to say, Lord, we, I just don't want my wife to have to work outside the home, somehow provide. And we did, and we did. And so it was tough. We made the cuts and all that kind of thing, and the Lord blessed because my wife and I, we both worked. The kids were little, going to the daycare and all that kind of stuff. And then we finally made, when we made a decision, it was tough. It was a big deal. But at that point, she stayed home. She started homeschooling the kids, and we never looked back. And God's provided. All I can say is God provided. Okay? I don't know how, but God did that. And so let me just throw that out to you, sisters. You know, I know some of you, you feel like you have to work, and we're not judging you on that at all. We understand that. God bless you for that if that's what God's leading you to do. But at least pray about it. Pray about it. Think through that. Because your children are so, are so important that way, too. Uh, and having you there 24-7 is better than anything else. I'll just say that much. But again, just pray through that. Think through that as the Lord. Because I know a number of you work, and you know my heart for you. I love you. Uh, but that's what God told us to do. And we did that, and God blessed. There will be an initial shock for some whenever you do it God's way. It'll be like, whoa, what are we doing? But God will bless. He'll help you each time, even with the inner conflict. But you decide, we're going to do it God's way. Trust the Lord, and He will bless you each time. Okay? Quickly. As far as the man is concerned, we've talked about this a little bit already, but God wants you to be a sacrificial lover of your wife, to sacrifice yourself for him. Just like Jesus said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The Lord Jesus Christ loved the church, died on the cross so that people could be saved, gave himself. And right now, I know you men, I've talked to you many times, you'd be willing as well. Be in such a way so sacrificial that you would give your life for your wife. But not only, for some of you, I, I would say you probably would give your wife for your life. You give your... <laughs> hush, brother, hush. <laughs> you would give your wife for your life. You would give your life for your wife. Amen. So I know you would do that, but here's the thing. Would you live your life for your wife? That's the key. Well, if someone came in and we're going to take out my gun and shoot them. Okay. What about every day of your life, living your life, that you may please your wife? Yeah. Oh, that's not scripture. Yeah, it is. First Corinthians chapter 11 says that the married man lives his life that he may please his wife. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, you're, you're loving the Lord. You're pleasing the Lord. But as a man, you are living to please your wife, too, as you love the Lord. Will you do that? Same thing for you ladies. Would you live your life to please your husband? It says that in the same passage. Christ left everything to come and die for us. He was completely submissive to the will of God. He not only willing to die, but he did do die for us. So here we go to our what wives wish their husbands knew about women. A practical learner of your wife. So let's get into this. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, Give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Do you know your wife? Do you know about her? Not just about women in general, but your wife. She is your wife. And you need to learn and love your wife. So knowledge of her practically, honoring her as you would all other believers, Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of the Lord. So... I wanted to give you, just, just, just for fun, as well as practicality, I wanted to read to, to you some of these things that some of the wives have written down as far as you men are concerned. Now, this comes right from Cross and Crown. And I really, as we got about 30 women in our church or so, uh, so you can guess one out of 30 who wrote these things. Or you may not want to know who wrote these things. But these are totally anonymous. One woman said that she wished her husbands, or husbands, not just her. <clears throat> My wife told me that. She goes, I'm going to write some things down, but it's not that you need to do them. But I think all men need to know this about women. And I said, okay, that's fine. So I know my wife's is in here too. So here we go. Ready? Here we go. The woman says this, what husbands should know about women, that when I share with him, I really don't want him to fix it. I just want a listening ear. And by the way, we talked about that two weeks ago. She also says that family comes before church, work, and friends. God only comes first. Flowers and chocolate are nice. 
Doing dishes, taking out the trash, and cleaning are very appreciated. And that he is loved very much. So that was sweet. One wife says she wishes husbands knew about women. This one says, We don't all want to hear how you love us, how pretty we are. We want you to demonstrate it, back it up with actions. Like doing what needs doing right away. Doing what needs doing without asking. Helping your wife is not taking out the trash, doing the dishes or laundry. These are your dirty dishes, your clothes. Ooh, who wrote this? And part of your household responsibilities. And by the way, let me just say this, because I agree with that. My wife and I, when we started having children, one came along, two came along, and, I, and then, of course, she stayed home, and then three came along, four came along. And I realized that these children, and she's working very, very hard, that as a husband, I needed to help her. Uh, these are my kids, not just her kids. So I spent time cleaning and doing dishes and the diapers and the whole thing, not saying, oh, this is what I'm doing for you. No, I'm doing this for us, for the family. These are all part of my responsibilities too, see. And that's the attitude that you need to take. So I get that. Um, don't try to shush me when I'm expressing my opinions. I do not know who this is. We will just leave that one right over there. <laughs> you can guess that one out. Here's another one. Pray with me out loud at night before bed. That's a good thing. Um, have announced as well as spur of the moment dates. He does do this, but I'd like it more. Talk just a little more, compliment me on my dress and etc. more. Okay, so guys, these are anonymous. These are just things to be thinking about. Here's one. As a wife, I feel like my husband should be spiritually more mature than I am. Think about that, guys. I want to see evidence that God is working in his life. You shouldn't rely on your wife to be the spiritual motivator and the one giving direction. But you, the husband, should be the example of patience, the example of grace, the example of love. Uh, I want him to listen to what I'm saying, not just be looking at me and thinking about something else. I'm guilty of that one. I told you that a couple weeks ago. And this is a good one. I appreciate when you are careful with your eyes, men. It reinforces that you love me and care how things affect me. So be careful on your eyes. And then one last one. Uh, the, ho the husband should help around the house, open the car door at home and in public, uh, consider my needs, buy flowers and gifts, works hard outside on our, on our stuff. I can't read it very clearly. Be considerate of my needs. Become even tempered and calm, great with finances, kind and hospitable. And this was her uh, thoughts. So, for you guys, think about your wife. Do you know her? What makes her tick? What, what is it that she needs in her life? And take those things as examples there. So, honor her as you would honor all believers. And let's see, guys, this is not working now. Can you help me out? Go to the next one. Well, Josh, can you help out? We were working really well there. Must have been something I read. <laughs> All right. Is it hung up, buddy? Amen. That's that? For emphasis. Yeah, be a practical learner. Be a, be a lover, be a learner. Going to work? The computer is frozen. All right, but we'll finish up with this then. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5. And when, you, when you're thinking about your relationship with your wife and these things that we just mentioned to you, 
as far as what wives wish their husbands knew about women. There are some other things I'm sure that you ladies probably thinking, man, I wish I would have wrote something down. You can still do that and get that into me if you want, and I'll take care of that, and we'll address that later on as well. But the key with all of this is try to be, try to think ahead, you know, try to think. Well, probably one of the, the biggest things that hel helped me in my life is when I try to put myself in the other person's shoes. When it, when it comes to people's feelings, even when it is a man, as a father, if I'm dealing with another man or if I'm dealing with someone in church, a church member or my wife, always keep that in mind that what you're about to say or what you're about to do is going to affect them a certain way. And the Lord really has shown me, or at least helping me see, that I've got to be real careful with that. When I say something to somebody, they're going to hear that a certain way. Whether I meant it that way or not, be careful what you say. Be careful how you say those things to your children or to your spouse or to the people that are in your life. Be so careful. Because we, we sometimes just say things without thinking about that. Um, I'm just going to give this information. I'm just going to say this or say that. In reality, you may be hurting their feelings. You may be hurting them. And be so careful with that. So when it talks about the wife as the weaker vessel, as the Peter Pass has talked about, in dwelling with them according to knowledge, I try to be very, very careful how I say things or how I don't say things when I leave things out. Because I want to make sure that I express my love to my wife, to my family, to my children, like the way the Lord Jesus would. So I'm very, very careful with that. So guys, when you're talking to your wife, think about what you're about to say. And if you say that, how badly that will hurt or not hurt them is how you say it. So put yourself in their shoes. Would you want to hear that? Would you want to be said these things that way to you? That's a very, very important thing to keep in mind. Um, the issue about your eyes, guys, the things that you look at. And again, I'll throw this out in a couple ways. One is... First of all, on the lady side, on the lady side, I've learned this, that if your husband, not to defend any bad things that he might be doing, but if, if, if your husband sees something and turns away or sees something and closes his eyes, it doesn't mean that he has sinned, okay? So please keep that in mind. I know that sometimes a lady will see a man and he'll see a billboard and then turn away. In her mind, he has lusted. But that's not lust. Lust is not seeing something. Lust is meditating on it. It is it's basically it's mo uh, meditating on the things that you've just seen. Some things we cannot help but see. And I've tried to explain this to my wife and to the, to the people that I've taught over the past. If something comes across your eyes, you turn your eyes away. It's that second glance that becomes sin. Or when you keep looking at it for more than you should, you should have turned away. Just because he saw it doesn't mean that he has lusted. Okay? Just seeing something doesn't mean that you have lusted after that thing. There was a guy years ago named Ron Riley that was a great evangelist that came down to Pensacola Christian College. And every year he would recruit kids for the summer. And he was a great evangelist and he said, I need men to go with me this summer to Daytona Beach. He did this every summer. And he said, I need about 20 men to go with me to Daytona Beach to pass out tracks and to witness the people on the beach. First thing that came to my mind was, are you kidding me? But he'd have a meeting, and he would say, listen, he would talk to these men. I did not ever go to this, but he would say to these men, you need to be spiritually mature right now because you're going to see things on the beach. You're going to see ladies in bikinis. You're going to see all kinds of wickedness on the beach. But he said, I need to know that you are mature enough not to lust after it so that you can talk to somebody and hand them a track and witness to them without lusting at them. When I heard him tell me that, that helped me a lot right there. Because, I, again, as a young man, you think because you see it, you're lusting. But that's not true. You, if, if you do see something, you, you're not necessarily lusting unless you have allowed lust to come up in your mind. 
And he understood that, and Ron Riley preached that, and he said, I need men to witness to these people because that's the only time we're ever going to see them, and there are thousands and thousands of these people that come to these beaches, and that's what he would do. That was his ministry. But at least that I understood that in my mind, that if something comes in my eyes, I don't have to lust after it. So for the women, just because your husband might see something, okay, you're in Walmart and a girl walks across and she's got some scantily clad, you know, she's not covered like she should be. And he sees her walk in front and then he turns his eyes this way. You don't have to slap him in the face and say, why did you look at that lady? He didn't necessarily lust after. See what I'm saying is be careful with that because you degrade your husband when you do that. If he truly is trying and he's not lusting after her, for you to accuse him of that degrades him. It demeans him, and he needs your respect. And hopefully I'll get there. Uh, okay, it's coming up maybe. He needs that respect. That's part of what you're supposed to do in honoring him. Yeah, but he looked at doesn't mean he lusted. Okay, so on that side of it, be very, very careful. You're watching television or you're watching a movie and something comes up and there's a you know, it's not the greatest thing to watch anyway. You shouldn't be doing that. But if something does come up like that and something flashes across the screen and he turns his eyes or he looks down, whatever, thank God for that. He didn't want to lust. He didn't want to look. But don't accuse him, okay? So you have to be so careful when it comes to that. Go back, Josh. You're way, way ahead, okay? Now for the, for the, the man side, understand this. That just like this person wrote here, how they appreciate when you are careful with your eyes, it reinforces that you love me and care how things affect me. So in that situation, understand this, man, that if you sense something coming up or you know that there's someone coming in the peripheral of your, of your eyes, then don't, don't purpose to look that way. Look away from that. Be careful of that. Purposely turn your eyes a different way because it does affect a woman. It does affect what they think. At least modest women. I have, I've, known, I've known ladies, girls, when I was coming up in high school and uh, people that I grew up with, stuff like that didn't even bother them because they were immodest themselves. They expected guys to look at girls. and that, That's out there too. That's a big deal. I understand that. But any modest woman... Any woman that has any dignity or shamefacedness about her, any humility about her, she's going to feel uncomfortable when another woman walks in the room that is scandally clad, okay, even in church. Another woman walks in church and her clothes are a little bit too tight. She's going to feel uncomfortable because of that right there. So be so careful. So on the guy side, if you sense that's happening, you turn your eyes and you simply go the other way, right? On the, on the woman's side, just because they're there, don't assume. So it goes both ways. That's all I'm trying to say about that. So here we go. Are we working now? So knowledge of her position in Christ, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So I, I love this verse because we are to submit one to another, and we know the Scriptures teach that the woman is to submit, submit to her husband. But look at that verse. There's no male nor female. We are to submit ourselves one to another. So I should be thinking about my wife all the time, how I can please her. A responsible leader of his wife, or the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. As a husband, I am to lead my wife, right? I, I pictured this, that when I see a husband and wife together, he is the, the leader and she is the, the follower, if you will. She is the heart, and he is the head. And it makes it, if you could think of it that way, that as, as you are embracing in a hug, your wife is your heart, and you are the head. And together you make the one and glorify the Lord. Ephesians 5, 28, So ought men love the wives as their own bodies. God gave man a responsibility to lead the wife. He's responsible for direction. He's to take care of the marriage. Uh, and all of that. Now, real quickly, I know I'm running out of time, but this is what I was getting at. The woman. The woman is to be the respecter. She's to have a meek and a quiet spirit. God sees this as a priceless ornamentation of your person. Sarah's example of meekness is respect, custom. She says, my Lord, my leader, 
all about her meekness, not about his title. It's about her. So the women, when you see your husband, you need to have respect for him, okay? Especially in this day and age right now when the world tears down manhood. The world tears down masculinity, don't they? I mean, if you've kept up with this at all, we are, being, we are attacked every which and way you can think of as far as men are concerned. So as a godly woman, your attitude should be, I want to respect my husband. And if something comes up, let's just go back to the eyes. If something comes up with the eyes, I'm going to respect him. I'm not going to demean him or accuse him because you really don't know what's going on in his mind. Right? So rather than assume, respect him and say, you know what? I'm going to assume the best because true love, perfect love casts out fear. Love thinketh no evil. If you truly love your husband and respect him, you're not going to assume he's lusting. See? So be careful with that. On the flip side, husbands learning about your wife, be careful what you're looking at. Even though you're looking at something there, the woman is there, and you can see her in your peripheral, don't even look at all. Because you know she may be thinking about that. So be careful. See, it all works together. Right? So a respecter, she's also to be a helpmeet servant. The Lord God said it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make a helpmeet for him. God's purpose for the woman was to be a helpmeet for the man, someone to help him fulfill the purpose of God in bringing glory to God. And that's what a wife should be. You are working together for the glory and majesty of God, and you have come together to help him fulfill that in his life. The help meet servant again, Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. And I, I highlight the word own because as a woman, my wife, by the way, get this now. I know some men have had issues with this in the past that I've dealt with. My wife is my wife. Amen. Amen. Right. She is to submit to her husband right. who is me. She doesn't have to submit to you. I've had a man in my past, men in the past in a church, basically come to me and say, your wife is an unsubmissive woman, or this or that about another woman. I'm saying, she's not your wife. Yeah, but she's supposed to be submissive, not to you. She submit to me. Well, that's not what the Bible No, the Bible says everybody submits to everybody. You're supposed to submit to her just as much as she's supposed to submit to you. What? Yeah, unless she's your wife. Look in the scriptures. Find that out. Well, women are supposed to keep silence in the church. That's true. That's a part of that too. I can explain later, but it doesn't mean there's a submit to every man. She's supposed to submit to her own husband, to me, not to you other men. You get that? Your wife isn't supposed to submit to me, not like she submits to you. As a pastor, there's a submission element there too, but not like you're thinking, okay? So be careful with that, you men. Just because you're, you, know, you see a lady there and she's, she's, she's got her own gifts and personalities, she's doing this and that and the other, and you tell her to do something. And she feels like she doesn't necessarily need to do that. She's not in sin, right? So understand that. That's hard for us guys to get, but that's, that's true. But we're all to submit one to another. But when it comes to you and your wife, yeah, oh yeah, there's a definite clear understanding there. Okay, Colossians, 1 Peter. The wife is to be in submission to her husband as prescribed to God in the marriage. Also, the help meet servant. This does not mean that she is any less than the man. Remember, in Christ, neither male nor female, but we are all one in Christ. Marriage is designed to glorify God in the respect of willful submission to the will of another. As Christ submitted his will to the Father, so the woman is a picture of the church submitting to Christ in the marriage realm. The glory of God is in focus here as well. Enthusiastic responder, I'll close with this. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. The church responds to Christ's love, so the woman responds to the love of her husband. And she should do that. You should give chocolates and candy, someone said, right? Guys, do that. She should respond to that. She should respond to your love. She should respond to your um, expressions, if you will. Just like we see the church is supposed to as well. I give you this last illustration about men being pursuers and women are responders because gender is a picture of the gospel. God's role assignments for men and women are a living picture of Christ's pursuit and provision of us. The church 
Uh, his bride, we, the females, are designed to be responders, not as punishment for being less skilled or weak, but because this is how Jesus asked us to glorify him. That was from Gabrielle Pickle, the Associate Director of Communications and so forth there. She's explaining very carefully how a woman is supposed to respond to her husband. So when we think about this, guys, um, as, and ladies, as we respond to our spouses, just remember how God has designed us, that we are to be as men, uh, lovers, if you will, and learners and leaders to our wives. The women are to be respecters and help me and so forth and submissive. So keep all of these things in mind as you're thinking about your marriage together, that the Lord will bless you as you are having children. Now, next time we talk, I want to talk about kids and how to raise those kids, how to be a father and a mother. But first, understanding how to be a man and a woman as a husband and wife is so very, very important. Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we could spend together this afternoon. We pray that you would help us to realize that the world in which we live hates marriage. They seem to have animosity towards the role of a man and a woman. And everything that you have told us about the role of men and women in the scriptures seems to be attacked all the time. And so, Lord, help us to be careful, to yield ourselves completely to you in every way that we can biblically. Help us to do that. Help us to have the character and the courage to follow you, that our men would be the, the leaders that they need to be, to walk with their wives in humble service and sacrificial love for them, and to love them like Christ loved the church. Lord, I pray for our women, that they would also respond and be respectful to their husbands. And Lord, realize how much all of this is at stake, not just between the two, but for your glory in the world. The world sees the marriage union between the husband and the wife. And Lord, sees your glory. Help us to realize we are your image bearers and we want to show the world what it means to be married and to know Christ. Thank you, Lord. Bless this week. We've got much to do. I know there's a lot going on at Pensacola Christian. We pray for the students going over there, the teachers that are over there. We pray for a special blessing. We ask for also your watch care over our men. Help us to be strong, Lord, to be men of character, men of dignity and honesty, like we heard this morning, truthfulness, that, Father, there would be a respect around us because of our character. And so, Lord, help us to have that in us by the power and grace of God. Bless our women. May they be surrounded with your grace. Bless them, those who have to work, those who stay home and are homemakers. Those, Father, every woman, that you would give them a measure of grace to help them be the women you want them to be wherever they are. And that the world might see truly a woman of God. Bless our children, those that go off to school at the Christian school or a public school or a home school. Lord, let them please guide and help them learn well, but protect their mind from all of the philosophies of the world. And so, Lord, bless us each. I pray for our singles. Lord, I pray especially protection for our ladies and our men both, that you keep their minds pure and their heart devoted to serve only Christ. So bless our families. Help us have a wonderful week. We dedicate ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we are going to have choir practice, so stick around if you're in choir. Otherwise, you're dismissed. And we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.